So we've done a few videos talking about cards from Seto Kaiba's deck. We talked about his monster cards. I think his top five best monster cards in the game. We also talked about many of his best spells and trap cards. And that was a top 10 list because one of the things that I've learned as I've been looking at these anime characters decks is that they actually have a lot of cards ended up being competitive in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. So for today's video, we're following a similar style. We're going to talk about all the monster cards that were found in Yugi Moto's decks throughout the many series of anime that he actually played in, and we're going to talk about which cards were the best in the competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG format. And I know some people think these intros are too long, but I really do want to clarify, these are cards that were viable in the competitive TCG format. And I mention that because on those Kaiba videos, I still get comments from people asking questions about, well, why isn't this anime exclusive card on your list? And the reason is, we're only talking about physical cards that were actually somewhat competitively viable. The big difference this time around is we're not talking about five cards, we're not talking talking about 10 cards, we're just talking about all the cards that I found Yugi played that were at least somewhat competitively experimented with or viable. And this is really cool too because it lets me talk about cards that maybe wouldn't have made it into the initial discussion video if I only did 5 or 10 cards. This really gives me a chance to talk about as many cards as possible, even ones that maybe aren't as good as the others. But doing it this way means we'll get a really rounded view of all the cards that Yugi played that actually were competitively viable. The first three cards we're going to talk about are all normal monsters and we had a couple of these on the Kaiba video as well, but it seems like Yugi's monsters are a lot more competitive than Kaiba's if we're just going off of how good they were in the TCG. So the first card we're going to talk about is Gemini Elf, and this card isn't very complicated because it's a normal monster, and while this card hasn't been played in probably the last 10 or so years, it still was a very iconic 1900 attack normal monster that was really powerful in old school Yu-Gi-Oh. This is not one of those cards like Vorse Raider, which is a card we talked about in Kaiba's video where we actually mentioned that that card actually did see some play in 2013. This is a card that really hasn't seen competitive play in a long, long time, but I think to many people it is one of, if not the most, iconic 1900 attack monsters. Next up we have Summon Skull, another normal monster that was very iconic and was actually competitively viable for many of the early years of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I say that because when a lot of people think back to old school Yu-Gi-Oh!, they think back to Dark Magician and Blue Eyes as being like the biggest normal monsters that take tributes, but I think in reality Summon Skull was a lot more competitive because it only took one tribute and had uh, the same amount of attack as our condition and only 500 less than blue eyes which meant that you could just power it up with like axe of despair or just get rid of your opponent's blue eyes with dark hole or regeki summon skull was a very competitively viable card in older formats but even to this day it's still pretty iconic because we keep getting more and more summon skull support we actually recently got like a summon skull synchro and ritual monster and fusion monster all these pieces of support for a very very old card so in a similar way while this card isn't quite Gemini Elf. It is a very strong one tribute normal monster that I think many people think fondly of when they sort of remember their old school Yu-Gi-Oh days and even to this day Konami is recognizing that the card is very iconic and that's why they continue to give it more and more support. And how could I do this video without at least mentioning Dark Magician? So admittedly I'm not the biggest fan of the Dark Magician deck. It is not the most competitively viable thing out there but I have to give Konami some kudos because Dark Magician is a very very old card. Obviously released right when the game came out, and as an iconic monster card of Yu-Gi-Oh, I think it is really important for them to continue to support it throughout the years in different ways, shapes, and forms. Some way to actually make it into a more competitively viable deck, or at the very least, a more modern strategy. And Konami actually did manage to do that in more ways than one. You know, this card has so many other support spells and support monsters and support traps that really make it sort of a competent, casual slash rogue strategy depending on the format. The deck certainly can and get some wins. It would be extremely difficult to make the Dark Mission strategy as viable as the Blue Eyes deck was back in 2016 when it won Worlds and was one of the best decks for a couple formats, but I think right now it's in about the right spot where Konami wants it to be. Not super competitive, but not super terrible as well, sort of right in the middle at that casual slash rogue status, and I think for the fans of the original series that want to play a deck centered around one of their favorite cards, I think there are enough supporting cards out there that you actually can do that at your local tournament. Two cards that Yugi also played that were very important in both old school Yu-Gi-Oh and even as recently as like 2012 were Witch of the Black Forest and Sangin, both of which actually can be combined into the best fusion monster ever, Sandwich. But besides the joke fusion monster that they have, these cards are very, very strong. So they search things, they search things that have either less than 1500 defense in the case of Witch or less than 1500 attack in the case of Sangin. So both these cards have been on and off the ban list. Currently they are off the ban list, but they have some changed effects. They are 
are much, much worse because you can't use the card that you add to your hand for the rest of the turn, but they're still kind of experimented with. I mean, we see Sangin being played every once in a while on Altergeist decks, and it's even been experimented with in a couple other strategies, but overall, these cards are sort of past their prime. It's kind of up to debate. I think they probably would be played if they had their pre errata version, but as it stands right now, they're a little bit too weak for modern Yu-Gi-Oh, but they still saw tons of play in old school Yu-Gi-Oh, enough play, obviously, to get themselves banned. As far as Sangin goes, the card was at one for a while back in like 2012, where it was played alongside Tour Guide from the Underworld and eventually found itself on the ban list. And that was a really sad moment because a lot of people like Sangin a ton. And when it was brought back, it had a very different effect that was nerfed quite a bit. So people weren't very excited, but it still is played in a couple decks here and there. Overall though, these cards I think are known as some of the earliest searchers in Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, you have a lot of cards that were made much, much better by the fact that they could be searched by one of these two options. And back in the day, decks didn't have as much searching as they do in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, so that was a pretty big deal. Yuki also took advantage of red, green, and yellow gadget, which are very good cards in old school Yu-Gi-Oh, even seen play, I mean, sort of through like 2012-ish as a stun strategy. These cards are very strong. I mean, back in the day, we didn't have every single card that searched other cards. I kind of just talked about that with Sangin and Witch. And the gadget cards, while they couldn't search everything, they could search each other, which sort of kept up the advantage. So what you would do in old school Yu-Gi-Oh is you play a deck where it didn't have a lot of monster cards that mostly just had these gadgets and you can play a ton of traps and a ton of removal spell cards so you just sort of got rid of all of your opponent's monsters but your monsters I mean as long as you drew that first gadget you could infinitely get to the next copies there wasn't a lot of effect negation back then so as long as you got to that first gadget card you probably could cycle through all of them multiple times then use cards like pot of avarice to put them back in your deck for a long time people would see these gadget cards and assume you were playing a very strong anti-meta rogue strategy and I think that's really awesome I don't have concrete information on whether or not Yugi played Morphing Jar number two or Cyber Jar or Fiber Jar, but he at the very least definitely played Morphing Jar number one, the original version. And that's really cool because while old school Yu-Gi-Oh did have draw power, I mean, you had Pot of Greed, you had Graceful Charity, and you had deck thinning like Painful Choice. It was pretty hard for a lot of decks to get a plus five, like in the case of Morphing Jar. And sure, it got rid of your opponent's hand and gave them some free cards. But if you could catch them off guard, you actually wouldn't give them that big of a plus while you would also be refilling your entire hand. So while this card isn't very fast and isn't very good in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, it was good for a long time in old school Yu-Gi-Oh, and it was a card that was found in Yugi Moto's deck. Curry Bandit might just be one of the best Karibo monsters ever released, and I can't really say for certain how powerful this card is in an actual Karibo strategy that's actually dedicated to playing all of those cards, because those types of decks aren't very competitively viable. As far as Curry Bandit goes, it was really good in a variety of other decks. I mean, we saw it in all sorts of things. We saw it in Light Sworn decks, we saw it in Sylvan decks, we even saw it in Dragon Lore decks, and that's sort of all big combo decks with a lot of monster cards. But what was super interesting about Kari Bandit in particular was that this card actually saw play not only in decks that played a lot of monster cards where you'd want to mill things, set up your graveyard, but it also saw play in a bunch of trap based decks. There's actually an entire deck based around it called Cat, spelled with a K, where you would play Kari Bandit, that's the K, you'd play Artifacts for the A, and you'd play Trap Tricks Monsters for the T. This was a very popular deck back in 2014 and a lot of people played it to very high competitive success at different events like YCS's and the WCQ. Overall, Kree Bandit was a very powerful card for a long time. Nowadays, a little bit too slow. I feel like I have a broken record in this video by saying that, but a lot of these cards, I mean, if you have end phase effects, if you have flip effects, it's not gonna be fast enough for modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But for a while, and not too long ago, five years ago at least, this card was very competitively viable when it came out in the TCG. And I feel like I have to mention Exodia the Forbidden One, at least for a little bit in today's video because while it is true that historically speaking Exodia decks have not been very successful they have been very iconic and certainly in some cases they have been taken to larger events. The highest placing of an Exodia deck would be when Jarrell Winston played this at Worlds back in the day and he got all the way to top 8 in that very specific format for that one specific event. But overall as I've mentioned in the Why Nobody Plays Exodia video this card hasn't been very popular but it is always one of those cards that is in the back of players' minds. Whenever people talk about or discover new draw spells, they always ask as one of the first questions, does this make Exodia any better? I mean, Super Rejuvenation just went from zero to three on the recent ban list. And a lot of the questions that I see about that card are, okay, is Deep Draw Exodia with Dragons actually a thing in 2019? And the answer is probably no, but people are still talking about it. I think that's really cool because of how old this card is that it 
still comes to people's mind when they're testing draw spells in new formats. Yugi also took advantage of Catapult Turtle, and admittedly, I wasn't really playing during the Magical Scientist FTK with this card, but I am very aware of the historical significance of that combo. That combo has been long banned, I mean, you can't really use it anymore, and this card isn't being played in modern Yu-Gi-Oh at all, but I think it is one of the many examples in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and I don't know why Konami keeps doing this, but this is just one of the examples out there of cards that have non-once per turn tribute a monster to inflict burn damage to your opponent that just keep getting broken in certain combos. We've seen it happen with the Shadow Priestess of Ohm and Cannon Soldier and all sorts of other cards, Amazonist Archer. I don't know why these cards keep getting printed. They do nothing to help the game, but Catapult Turtle was one of the ones that I think Konami was trying to balance by making a higher level monster so you can't just normal summon it. In the context of the Magical Scientist FTK, that didn't really work, but I'd say overall it actually did help a lot. We saw Cannon Soldier getting abused a lot more than a card like this. I think that one level actually does make a huge difference as far as modern FTK combos. Not that those exist very often. I mean, we saw Danger FTK a year back, but that wasn't even like the most popular deck of the format and very quickly got addressed on the ban list. And I think realistically speaking, Catapult Turtle probably will never be a problem again. There are so many other cards like Cannon Soldier, like Cannon Soldier Mark II, like Amazonist Archer that all outclass this card. So I think it's probably fine to just keep this card at three copies per deck. I really haven't heard of an FTK that uses this card but can't use the other cards besides of course Magical Scientist FTK but obviously Magical Scientist is banned so it doesn't really matter anymore. Another turtle card is Electromagnetic Turtle and this card actually was played a little bit. It would have been played more if it got released like six months earlier in the TCG. In the OCG format they had this card for a much longer time and it saw play in tons of decks but as far as the TCG goes we got a little bit too late. I remember a couple people playing this card in decks like Light Swarns or Infernoids if you were playing that grass looks greener. Those decks would mill a bunch of cards on the first turn, usually around 20 cards, and milling one copy of this was pretty valuable in certain matchups. Not the most successful card to ever come out, but if it would have been released like six months earlier or nine months earlier, it definitely would have seen a lot more play. That's just sort of one of the issues that you can have when you have an OSG card and you're sort of waiting around for it to get imported into the TCG. Sometimes cards that were really good in one format are a little bit too late when they come to the TCG format. The next two cards I'm a little bit confused about because I haven't watched all the anime episodes and I'm not actually sure if Yugi played these cards. I found that someone that was using a Yugi deck uh, later on in GX actually did have these cards in that deck, but I don't actually know if that means that Yugi played them. But we have Dark Magician of Chaos and Blacklisted Soldier Envoy of the Beginning. I think for a lot of people these were iconic banned cards for a long time. They both are currently completely unrestricted on the ban list. Dark Magician of Chaos has a much, much worse effect from its original ability and probably would have stayed banned if they didn't change it. As far as BLS goes, the card just wasn't fast enough for modern Yu-Gi-Oh. It did see play in some Burning Abyss decks and some early Thunder Dragon lists. It could see play in the future. It's not a bad card by any stretch of the imagination, but it isn't quite good enough going first for a lot of people to actually put it into their decks. Overall though, these cards are very strong, or at least were very strong uh, pre errata in the case of Dark Nation of Chaos. And as far as BLS goes, it was very strong for a long time in those older Chaos strategies. Right now, though, it's a little bit too slow for modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And because I feel obligated to, yes, I will mention the god cards. So the god cards are not very competitively viable. I'm sure most of you already know that if you've watched any of my previous videos. After all, one of my biggest videos is talking about why the god cards aren't very good, but they were played in Yu-Gi's deck as far as I can tell. And I guess they're not the worst cards in the world. I mean, they're better than like some of the normal monsters that he played. Obelisk in particular actually did see a little bit of competitive success in Frog decks as well as a couple Dragon Ruler decks as a funny tech option against other Dragon Ruler opponents. In general though, if you want to hear more about these god cards and why they weren't very competitively viable, you can check out many of the other videos I've done on these particular cards. However, for the sake of argument, they were technically played in a couple competitive strategies, so they will be mentioned in this video. Also, I know I am still very behind, or I guess not super behind, but four days behind on reviewing one spooky monster card at the end of every single video in October. So in today's video we're going to look at two ghost trick monsters we have ghost trick lantern and ghost trick specter so there are a lot of ghost trick monsters that i could talk about this month and maybe i'll talk about one or two more later on but these are the first two that i want to talk about because they're two of the most important ones for the very first wave of support of ghost tricks that a lot of people think of when they think of a strategy lantern has an attack blocking effect and specter special summons itself when a monster is destroyed and then also gets you a free draw there are ghost trick monsters that are individually more 
powerful than either of these cards and maybe even ghost like monsters that as the deck got more and more support that ended up being a lot better but in terms of like the original ghost trick deck with the just the first wave of support i think a lot of people found themselves playing these cards over the other options there were other cards that people played but when people really think of ghost tricks i feel personally that these two are some of the most important ones that people keep bringing up or at least used to bring up when the deck was getting talked about anyway though i think this video ended up being way longer than i originally planned that is one of the issues with not doing a top five video or a top 10 video is i can just keep adding more and more cards and keep talking on and on and on i love talking about Yu-Gi-Oh cards so i don't actually limit myself to just five or just ten cards the video goes on a little bit longer than maybe some people would like maybe in the future i can try to limit it but we'll see what the feedback is on this video anyway though i'll see you guys later thank you so much for watching goodbye